Okay, hi everybody. Um, good morning uh, from here uh, in New York, uh, but also good afternoon, good night, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we're very happy to be here with you and share some information about the uh, MS in Advanced Architectural Design Program. Uh, my name is Lydia Calipoliti. I'm the new director of the MS AAD program. I just started this position in September um, and I have the great privilege of inheriting it from uh, the Dean of the school, Andres Hake, who has been directing it for the past uh, six years. Uh, I would also like to introduce uh, Shaoshi Chen, uh, who is the assistant director of the MSAD program. And uh, she has been in this position for, uh, for quite a while and can answer any kind of logistical questions or um, kind of curriculum questions. Um, she has a great experience in that. Uh, before I begin, Shashi, do you want to share something with uh, with the group, maybe? Um, hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, and to echo Lydia, um, welcome to this Zoom space from wherever you are in the world. And I'm looking forward to meeting some of you in person. Great. So um, I'll start by saying that um, the this program has been very important uh, for me when I was a student like you um, in the late 1990s in Greece, which is where I'm from. And um, it's extremely, you know, I was really fascinated when I looked at um, these uh, these kinds of abstracts, which were the compilation of student work in um, in a magazine, uh, kind of traveling to get them from all over the world. And it was full blown terrain and territory of experimentation that has a very important legacy and history. And at that point, when I was studying, uh, it was famous for the paperless studio under Bernard Chumi and Stan Allen and developing kind of revolutionary approaches and computer uh, aided practices before digital media were, were ubiquitous in, uh, in design practice. So um, the program kind of stands on a very, uh, very long legacy of experimentation and the use of the field of architecture as a laboratory. And it has had substantial impact on the lives of many uh, people um, crafting their future trajectory as thinkers, practicing architects and creative citizens. So um, the AAD, this is um, the building that we are, uh, uh, that we're at uh, Avery Hall, uh, where we are every day and where you will be um, if you come to the program. It's a program of advanced architectural design. So it's not for those that uh, are looking for uh, professional experience and the basics of architecture, but um, it's an opportunity to go deeper in how architecture can possibly affect change in society and how each of you may develop and shape your own voice, whether you want to become professionals, academics, scholars, or all of the above simultaneously. Um, overall, I would say that the AAD program nurtures a renewed architectural imagination, and it has done that for quite a while, zooming in from the microscopic scale of materials to the macroscopic scale of planetary developments. It is a program that is deeply invested in how we may think of architecture as an agent of change, and by doing that, also positioning ourselves as leaders in the evolution of fields. So the history is a powerful tool for, as a piece of evidence, the history of the program. It has nurtured the emergency of digital practices, as we've discussed with the paper the studio, um, anticipated the notion of the contextual and introduced metropolitan culture to architecture. Now, at this moment in time, it is deeply connected to the context of interconnected global crisis, the climate emergency, social inequity, and cultural upheavals. And um, through the context of the program, we investigate what is happening in the world, ranging from the climate crisis to societal divides, geopolitical tensions, the potential of technology, but also the defiance of technology. Basically, what are the cultural frameworks within which uh, technology is developed and applied and how they leverage power regimes? So in this light, and these are very broad, 
words uh, still, we're going to get down to the uh, to the kind of analytical uh, of the curriculum. We investigate how architecture constructs, distributes, and leverages power, as well as how spaces are shaped by larger political agendas that unequivocally involve questions of race, gender, biopolitics. So this very broad conceptual setting shapes our notion of advanced architecture. Uh, you will be surrounded here by a talented cohort of people from around the world, many people from New York, many people from other places in the world to lead change and evolution and the future of architecture. What are the next steps of the discipline as a whole? And we do it all from Avery Hall, um, which is at the heart of the main uh, campus at Columbia University. Avery also houses, I know this kind of GIF is a little bit dizzying, but it's really important to see the library, um, which is an extraordinary architectural and fine arts library. One of the most richest, one of the richest collections of um, rare materials and architecture, historic preservation, art history, painting, sculpture, graphic arts, decorative arts, city planning, real estate, archaeology, uh, all the kind of related and tangential fields to architecture in the world. It is really a reference library that we use throughout the courses and one of the most important um, kind of focuses of different history theory courses. So in the context of the program, it's important to state that uh, practice, pedagogy, and research are intrinsically interconnected. And the curriculum is built around this kind of circular journey. Basically, what we teach is what we practice, and this is fueled by research and innovation, and that's what makes the AAD program so unique as we strive to address the most pressing issues in the world via a critical lens. We do that through design, through writing, through research, activism, mediation, community engagement, scientific mobilization, policy, and many other forms of technological development coordinated to design practice. And overall, we believe that there are eight principles that govern our pedagogy. And the first principle is that of environmental engagement. Uh, it really is something unavoidable at this moment in time. And by mentioning environmental uh, engagement, we speak of uh, ecology, uh, climate, basically the paradigm of the climate crisis in which we live. We explore different facets of the climate change as these intersect with architectural production, including environmental degradation, the erasure of natural habitats, climate migration, environmental inequality, and the contribution of the building industry to the carbon footprint and pervasive pollution. We question how the production of built spaces affects, um, may be explored through alternative natural and technological expressions that aim toward decarbonization and mitigate the contaminating and extracting nature of our desires and protocols. The second principle advocates that we definitely want to mobilize technology. We have several courses um, that we develop advanced technologies and interrogate technological advan uh, advancements, but we also want to hold technologies accountable. Uh, we love using technologies, it's unavoidable, and it is uh, really um, something that is required within the present day. Uh, but we consider them critical um, also to interrogate the cultural and social frameworks under which these technologies operate. So for example, where are the systems of power that technologies cater and what it is that makes them possible? We really want to acknowledge all the technological ecosystem of contemporary practice and understand a kind of wide span of where uh, different networks of power lie. We also believe in the great capacity of architecture to rearticulate society. And this is a very ambitious statement, but it is also a very important one. We don't think that architecture is a vessel within which we place societies. 
but actually architecture articulates how we can understand the social. Moreover, society is composed by both humans and non-human entities, and this alliance sustains our thinking processes throughout the program. When we look at buildings and when we design buildings and other artifacts, infrastructures, practices, and cultures, we understand the social in conjunction with humans and other forms of life. We're also specifically interested in the ecological biodiversity and alternative material cultures through regeneration and circular reasoning. And this is what brings us to the next principle, which is material cyclabilities. Um, basically, we do not think of materials as objects that we can purchase and buy from a catalog and then we apply to buildings. Rather, we look at the entire cycle of material phases. Where do they come from? What are the processes of extractions that are related to the materials that we use? What are the communities that are affected and related to their production, distribution, and recycling? What is the second life of materials? And how do we intervene in those different processes so that the ways in which architecture is produced may empower the ways in which perceive entire cycles of material lives? Questions of these kind are also explored in our labs at GSAP, and this is something that we will show later on. We have the Natural Materials Lab um, that you may have visited or will have the opportunity to visit. In some research projects, we're working with molecules of proteins, animal or vegetable proteins like fish proteins that are released in the water and collected and used as a glue to mix with natural fibers making composite materials that, that we can print, assemble, or disassemble. We work with the logistics of materiality or with what it means to reuse different kinds of materials, um, examining a whole range of processes from high-tech to low-tech cultures of the material life uh, that are fundamental to the ways in which we explore materiality that go beyond the modern notion of anthropocentrism. And this brings us to the next principle, which is that of interspecies relationships. So contemporary challenges require us to consider that no longer we can sustain the idea of anthropocentrism, that the human is at the center of culture, discourse, and spatial production, and the rest of the species are sacrificial. The world that we occupy asks us to form interspecies relationships and alliances between different forms of life. So we want to ensure that when we consider wood as a material, we think of the forest, the life in the forest, as well as the communities that are part of this life. For us, the notion of community is much more complex than it was, let's say, in the 1960s, when it was extremely popular to think of participatory design processes related to, uh, to governance and civics. Now, uh, we think of the notion of community as ecologically constituted from different living entities. This assessment promises to destabilize the anthropocentric tradition by shifting the focus to other forms of life. And in doing so, it calls for the, the dissolution of normative boundaries, like dichotomies of what is natural and what is artificial, what is human and what is non-human, highlighting new types of environments created by fluctuating networks of ecosystems. So we design for the benefit of an entire assembly of planetary species whether these are animal, vegetal, microbial, technobiological, as well as human, in the face of different anthropogenic disasters, um, acknowledging uh, different complexities of life and multi-species possibilities of collaboration. We also understand that the realities that we're living in are constituted in an assembly of online and offline urbanities that is something that we have in many ways naturalized. Um, most curriculums do not cover that. We primarily cover the production of physical space. 
but we claim here that there's no way we could relevantly understand the material world unless we analyze, assess, mobilize, and infiltrate online realities, which also have a material dimension. So the most important example is the physical imprint of the cloud, of the digital cloud, where we all store information, and that is an inevitable part of everyone's lives. Uh, the physical footprint of that is farms, servers, data centers, infrastructures of massive grounding and physical footprint that require an immense amount of energy and substantially affect in their production bodies, landscapes, and ecosystems. Design operates at the intersections of these realities, and here we have studios that very deeply address some of these topics. We also pay close attention to all developments that have recently come to the forefront of public debates relative to questions of identity. And this goes from feminism, parenthood and care to aging populations, healthy aging and racialization. We take very seriously the task to decolonize the curriculum and critically address the tensions, segregations and inequalities resulting from racial bias, also the ways in which architecture has long been complicit in sustaining such inequalities and biases. Finally, we address geopolitical tensions in the framework of designing territories and mapping conflict. We live in a moment that is incredibly prescient relating to what is happening in the world in the Middle East, the US border with Mexico, Ukraine, and the Gaza Strip. And we see, for instance, that something that is considered a technical parameter, like how we use gas, is fundamentally architectural. The ways in which we use, we use gas, the way in which gas is distributed, shapes territories and tensions. It shapes borders, access, and space. And it is, and it is, definitely an architectural endeavor and responsibility with which we should deeply engage. And so we do that within New York City, that in many ways becomes a laboratory of our operations, a microcosm of all the topics that we have covered and where all of these tensions in one way or another appear. This potentially gives us embedded criticality. Criticality is incredibly important to our curriculum and it is loaded with discourse, with activism, uh, with confrontations, different models of the future projected in the design work that you will be producing. And design is mobilized in many ways as a force for change in societies and in ecosystems. And of course, we do that through a calculated and tailored curriculum, but also a curriculum that even though it looks quite rigid in this um, matrix, it is flexible and it is intended for you to navigate it and to inhabit it, to use it the way that you find best to craft your own trajectory. Each graduate of the AAD program is totally different. And it is, but at the same time, um, you would be also part of a very tight cohort and community of people that will form, in many ways, bonds for life. So it is really important to emphasize that uh, this is the curriculum. It's, it's very simply stated in this matrix, but you have a huge flexibility to define your own track within the program. The first semester is the summer semester. So you would be starting at the end of May. And it is in many ways, I think this is the description of Andres Hake, uh, but I agree with it 100%, an injection of complexity and an injection of intensity in many ways. Uh, get ready for it. It's, it's, it's very intense, but at the same time, it's extremely rewarding and fun. Uh, you don't suffer. It's just a moment of critical assessment where you would be having um, an elective design studio, which is nine points, 
And there are, there's between 10 and 11 elective design studios in the summer, uh, all ranging in the topics that we have previously discussed. Um, and uh, you go through these systems through a lottery and um, you always get, I think, either your first, second or third choice. So um, there's a very good system in place, um, placing students uh, to the right studios. And at the same time, you're reading and writing all the time in the summer in two courses, Arguments and Transcalarities, where you're developing your writing skills through very short assignments, like 500 word uh, assignments that are reviewed with your instructions. So you're designing and writing and you have lectures every week. Uh, you have moderated discussion groups um, and all the complexity of these topics uh, that I was uh, speaking about before becomes uh, manageable and uh, you're in the ground. By the end of this process, you become aware of your horizons, of the leading edge of architectural evolution and its relationship to urban practices, spatial practices, and visit and uh, buildings. I would say it is an incredibly uh, effective time. So this goes, um, you know, all of the topics that we were mentioning before are kind of cross reading throughout the different courses of the summers and migrating uh, in the curriculum. And uh, the advanced studios is, are incredibly lively. This is what they look like. Each of you would have a place in the studio, your own space, but you would also be part of a collective uh, to discuss, gather. It's kind of like a little minor city that is permanently active. So in the summer, we also have the arguments course parallel to the design studios. And in this course, we host many guest critics every week from all over the world coming to present their work on the topics that we have discussed. You will have the opportunity to discuss with them, to ask them questions, uh, learn how to ask them questions by, uh, by uh, doing readings on their work. It is a luxury, honestly, to be in this kind of environment and um, to have uh, tailored precept courses that teach you how to ask questions to these kinds of important figures um, and, you know, some of the figures that you see on the screen include designers like Forma Fantasma, thinkers like Keller Easterling, but also thinkers outside of architecture doing research and working in tangential fields and mobilizing architecture. It's a moment of interdisciplinary alliance. So, for instance, we have had uh, Laura Poitras, who is an investigative filmmaker who did amazing documentaries on the lives of activists exposing U.S. government surveillance and military tactics, including the birth of the NSA and other thinkers like Jack Halberstam on gender studies and Rua Benjamin, um, who is a transdisciplinary scholar with a critical creative approach on the social dimensions of science, technology, medicine, and race. That's, um, that's her. Um, in Transcalarities, which is a different course, we also meet every week in Wood Auditorium, the entire class, and we discuss in detail 15 case studies of architecture of the last decades that address in different ways uh, many of the principles that we have outlined before. The course is an opportunity to get familiar with the complexity of design and to expand your design culture and capabilities by looking in detail to the most important cases of architectural design of the last decades. What you basically need to do is to study in detail some of these studies, and by the end of the summer, you will have studied more than 300 case studies, which will immensely enhance and enlarge your critical capabilities in design. And we do this both in the auditorium that you see on the screen, but also in smaller groups. In addition, we have the Makerspace, the Fabrication Center, where you can come and develop your work and build models and prototypes, but you can also get jobs here as assistants. 
Um, it is a large maker ecosystem space in two different floors that is always very active and vibrant. And I would say that the people running it are extremely helpful and nice. We also consistently work with experts from other fields, and that's a constant condition of the program in the school. Experts from across the university and beyond. For those that are not familiar with Columbia, we have the Climate School that also hosts the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is one of the most important scientific centers for the evolution of the natural world dedicated to climate and ecology. And you can visit this center and work with it on many different fronts. The presence of experts is constant and the forms of interdisciplinary collaboration is also content, constant within the AAD program. The work of students is uh, presented to large audiences and juries uh, from different fields from the university and beyond. This is, for example, a presentation in a design jury. Uh, you see Shaoshi here, um, and you have the opportunity to be in conversation with many experts who will support your work and enhance your ideas, understand the challenges that your projects may pose, and help you take your ideas further. And I want to say that the guest uh, critics, and so you see some in this photograph, are really invested in your work, and they are some of the most important voices in architectural discourse and production uh, that are out there today. So after the summer, um, you have a few days off, maybe like 20 days, uh, but you get a little bit of a break, and then you have the fall and the spring semester uh, where the intensity returns. And at that point, you are blended with the entire school that becomes your panorama. Um, and you are uh, taking studios in coalition with the last year of the MARC program, uh, the, the, the MARC students in their final year. You're definitely prepared for this transition after the summer because you've already gone through a huge process of immersion and transition. And actually we find that AAD students are the most intellectually prepared um, in the school as a whole. And they have a unique voice on contemporary tensions, but also in the understanding of architectural capacities uh, and how these can be tested. And then besides the studios, there are about 18 elective studios in the fall and the spring. There are also the electives. And by choosing the electives, you really craft your own trajectory. Uh, there are in very big, there's a very big number of electives in different fields. Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but there are electives on technology, computation, and representation and also significant history theory electives. But beyond this, you can take also electives from uh, other programs of the school, like the curatorial program, the computation program, uh, the real estate, urban planning, um, but also in other schools like the engineering school. Um, and we will help you if you have a particular trajectory that you want to focus on, we can advise you, counsel you and help you on how to cross register in different kinds of schools and craft your own interests. It's also a kind of logistics note that is important to note here is that uh, your required points are 15 for every semester in order to graduate, but you have the opportunity to take up to 19 credits each, sem uh, each semester and uh, without paying additional tuition, and I would really advise you to, uh, to take that opportunity and uh, use the electives of, of the school, the whole ecosystem. And of course, if that's too much of a workload, you can always drop a semester in the, uh, uh, not a semester, sorry, a course um, in, um, in the middle. And last but not least, we have an incredible um, kind of cohort of faculty. Uh, each of them are very different but uh, they are really uh, some of the most important thinkers um, that are out there in the world, ranging from practitioners to cutting edge history theory faculty to important vo voices on questions of race 
um, and uh, inequity. Um, just give me one second because my computer is stuck. You see some of the faculty here and always uh, feel free to navigate the faculty that are so, so, so many in the website. A lot of their work um, is online. All right, so now that we have uh, moved through uh, this, I will present some of the work that is um, that is out there in the program. Uh, some samples or examples about the kinds of uh, work that are being produced. So this is a, an example of a project that uses machine learning to analyze the material stock of a city so that the components of buildings may be reorganized to reconstruct the city by using the same materials, by mining the materials of existing buildings, so that the overall energy efficiency could be multiplied. This type of project is only possible in a place like Columbia GSAP, and one of the reasons is that we have computation courses that are very explicitly aligned with uh, design studios. This is another example of a project which focuses on the notion of waste within our societies in the city of New York. And the project proposes infrastructures that are like vertical parks, uh, bringing together different kinds of species so that the waste that is produced by humans becomes the habitat in which other species may live. By analyzing the relationships between different species, we can consider new spaces and programmatic alliances closing material cycles so that we can develop new kinds of relationships with our waste. And this is a project that was awarded the Paris Prize. Here's another example of the Bernard Chumi studio where the students designed climatic devices that help the regulation of New York City's climate by mitigating the impact of climate change through these floating islands in the east of the Hudson River. Um, here's another example, using the capacity of robotics to generate performative environments uh, to change uh, permanently programmatic conditions that are required for different time periods. And another one also interrogating uh, the notion of, uh, of waste and reusing it in different ways. Another very important and fun activity is that we travel to. And these are some, um, some pictures and photographs of, um, of travel. Every spring studio travels, uh, they go to different locations. And this is something that is uh, funded by the school. Um, so you can choose to go to Japan or Los Angeles or uh, Rio or uh, whatever other location or India the studio offers. Uh, this is uh, another one. It's a very important and one of the most uh, fun um, kind of moments of the pedagogy. Uh, there's a special week, the Kinney week, uh, before uh, spring break that all the studios travel and it is a very important part of the curriculum. Um, this is the trip that uh, Shaoshi and Andres took in Iceland, for example. Uh, uh, Andres is the former uh, director of the program and the dean of, of the school, and they went to Iceland. And uh, it's the trips are very important. I, of course, it's a wonderful, fun opportunity to be with your cohort, but it's also a kind of ground experience where instead of surfing the web and looking for information, you see and note and have field notes of the problems that you're interrogating. 
And it was possible to understand firsthand at that point the effects of the climate crisis on glaciers. Uh, and for instance, in Iceland, uh, the sea is not rising because of the weight of glaciers that is disappearing. Um, maybe Shayoshi can uh, tell you more about that because she was on this trip. Uh, do you want to do a parenthesis or um, you want to jump in here oh, for a minute? I'll do a, I'll do a small parenthesis. So as Lydia um, is you know, sharing with you guys that in spring semester, the, it's called Kenny Travels, but all the studio options have a travel component to it and it is funded. So it's not extra tuition. Um, and all the travels highly tied to the pedagogy of your studio, which um, you will select by studio lottery. In this studio in particular, we're looking at climatic, political, uh, more than human conditions in the Arctic. So we had this really amazing trip in Iceland meeting with intergovernmental organizations and uh, indigenous tribal councils sort of, you know, at the in the Arctic in which many of um, the climate effects were felt firsthand. And in a previous slide, um, it was a picture of us meeting with a mycology um, scientist specialist in the Arctic, which is, if you know, if you're familiar with that, is the study of fungi, um, which, so it's really exploring all forms of life in the Arctic. So this is just one of the many offerings um, that is refreshed every year. So Kenny travels in spring semester is really a special time for you guys. Thank you. That was really important to see the kind of different layers of depth to which all of this travel um, is, is delving into. So, um, you know, this is a very broad presentation and we cannot cover, we're covering basics, but once you're here and once you're part of the program, there are so many layers of depth that you can navigate uh, to enhance your research capabilities. It's also important to, I wanna underscore the significance of the computation and representation sequences that are run by uh, Laura Corrigan, who's the, direction, the director of the computation program at, uh, at GSAP. And uh, this year we have introduced a kind of um, new kind of flexible curriculum in computation that's called the computational glue. And it is a collaborative effort of program directors to offer elective coursework across programs that involve computational tools and methods related to the practices of each program. So you see the different kinds of fields here, generative methods, visualization, geospatial studies, interaction, gaming, that, uh, that we can help you navigate through relative and tailored to what your studio uh, would practice. Um, and these are a little bit more um, a kind of analytical breakdown of what uh, each course is exploring. So the computation sequence uh, recently also developed um, a kind of uh, open tutorial platform. You see this here on the screen for all courses. Uh, it has a weird name. It's called uh, Smorgasbord. Um, I asked Laura Kurgan why, um, and there's a story behind it. But what's really amazing is that this is a public interface. You can log into it and see how to, uh, it, it's basically a how-to resource and guidebook that has different kinds of recipes, how to do X, Y, Z relative to what your studio asks you did. So there's tutorials and there's uh, generating density and there's, uh, making an archive, like how to use GIS, how to map surfaces. It's really an exciting and important resource available to everyone um, at GSAP and beyond. We also have, uh, this is uh, the Natural Materials Lab that's run by uh, Lola Ben Alon, um, who is uh, the founder and director of that lab. And uh, these are the kinds of, of things that they do. It has an amazing pool of uh, courses in the tech sequence. Uh, they mostly use earth mixed with fibers and other materials and use different techniques of makings, mixing, mulching, 3D printing. Uh, but I would encourage anybody interested in 
climate environment and how these interact with materials and technology to take a look at uh, the possibilities of these courses. And at the same time, we dedicated our efforts to generating the highest level in discourse design and activism and the way that they interact. Here we return to Avery Library that houses thousands of books, magazines, and rare items. A number of our graduate each year are accepted into Ivy League uh, PhD programs. Um, and the culture of critical discourse is extremely important and relevant in our school. It affects everyone. And whether you're trying to develop a kind of innovative design practice or uh, per, uh, pursue a scholarly trajectory, you would benefit from this intellectual pedigree and intensity in the school, which is some of the most important thinkers of the last decades uh, here in the school. And we also produce books all the time. Uh, we, uh, we, you know, there's a publication house within Columbia, but there are also um, a lot of events that discuss books and the content of books. We discuss books, we have libraries open, uh, we have book presentations, lunchtime in the staircases. And, um, and this is something that really kind of enlarges the pedagogy um, in the public space of the school. Um, also, I wanna say that the AAD program presents the unique possibility to apply for teaching assistantships and work as teaching fellows. Once you graduate in the summer, not this summer, for example, but next summer, it is possible to apply to become a teaching fellow. It's kind of like a teaching assistant, but it's a work position. It's a job uh, to work with a main uh, professor and teach a summer studio. Um, at GSAP. There are 10 associate positions in the summer, but there are also other possibilities throughout the year for teaching assistantship. So if you're interested in having a design and a teaching profile, we make sure that you're equipped for that. And um, there are many opportunities to explore. And oh yes, this is what, what I was talking about, the Summer Studios TA. Um, so um, that's a really incredible opportunity. We also have a lot of student organizations. So students in the pedagogical environment are not just members of the university, but they're also university citizens. And this is something that we take very seriously and is very important to us. We offer students the possibility to form their own initiatives, associations. We also trigger and, um, and initiate in, uh, these uh, kinds of groups uh, with the funds of the school, but uh, we're very open to receiving um, kind of um, proposals to form your own associations. I encourage you to take a look at the website. Uh, this is a very lively pedagogical and rewarding environment uh, that we have here. Every week is something is happening. And we're also in New York. So whatever we do, New York is part of our ecosystem. We have the most multicultural neighborhoods um, and uh, the presence of many important architectural offices, NGOs, intergovernmental alliances, associations, agencies from the United Nations uh, to whatever else you can think about. Finally, as a logistical note, and for many of you that are international students, this is quite important. The program is STEM accredited. So for those of you that do not have US citizenship and would come to the program to study with a visa from abroad, you get three years of practical training, the opportunity to work in the US, in New York or elsewhere in the US for three years after the graduation of the program. And that's extremely important. It is so much better than the one year that, um, that I had when I graduated as a student. So it is something that a lot of students uh, take advantage of. So when you come here and enroll, um, we will be with you, working with you every day, every weekday, 
And we will do this with huge enthusiasm because we believe in this program. We believe in the cohort and the pedagogy to reshape the future of architecture. So that's all I had to say for now. Uh, but uh, Shaoshi will have uh, a kind of longer parenthesis this time, I'm sure. Um, you know, why don't you fill in and then we can take any questions that you may have um, to uh, to discuss. I'll stop sharing, but Shaoshi, you can uh, maybe when, you know, do your um, speech and I'll stop sharing after that. Um, okay, well, I mean, there's not, there's logistical, I'm sure you guys may have questions, which I'm happy to answer, whether it's about the requirements or maybe how the studio process is. Um, I'll also drop a link that there for, let's say, more logistical emissions, you know, including financial aid and things like that, um, you know, sort of emission deadlines. There is a, um, a session with just the emissions team um, this Friday. Do you guys, um, I'll drop the link below. Um, while that's happening, um, maybe I'll speak a little bit more about the studio lottery process. So in the summer, um, you have between 10 to 11 studio options to choose from. And the way that um, you're placed in studio is by lottery. So all the instructors would um, make a presentation and then you would basically rank your choices from one to 11. And then there's a blind system in which people are trying, we're trying to place people based on their top choice. It's actually run by student representatives. So nobody in admin. So we're trying to make it as fair as possible. Um, and in fall and in spring, you join with the larger group and the MARC class, the master's architecture class, who are students who are in their third years for advanced studios. And then you'll have 18, at least eight, 17 or 18 studios to choose from. And again, um, it's by studio lottery. So you watch all the presentations and you can really rank the um, the options that are made available to you. What this implies, of course, there's this incredible diversity of um, studio options um, with really some of the most interesting practitioners, um, whether it's, um, let's say, David Benjamin looking at um, natural materials and working with scientists, or Emmanuel Matsu uh, looking at um, abolition of property, to um, Maria Luzagaro, who's looking at more than human uh, assemblages. Um, and all this is, you can see who's teaching right now at GSAP um, in the faculty website. Um, so it's a really good time. 